welcome everyone to our app Raspberry Pi Foundation Computing Education Research Seminar. I'm Jane Waite and I'll be chairing today's seminar. I'm so excited to welcome you to our ninth seminar, which is on K to five um, computing education research. That's children from the age of five to 11 years old. Um, and over these research seminars, we've been exploring how research can help us to support these young learners and their teachers um, in the teaching and learning of computing. Then this brings on me on to the best bit, which is to welcome our speaker, and that's Dr. Aman Yada, who is the Lapan Phillips Professor of Computing Education at Michigan State University. And, you know, I've been reading and quoting um, a man's work ever since I started <laughs> um, and he's got such wealth and experience as a researcher in terms of particularly around teacher professional development and evaluation um, and I know that lots of his work is around problem-based learning and online learning and it really is about um, enhancing students experiences um, in terms of computer science and education across all levels and notably he recently <laughs> So he's into computational thinking, just like I am. So it's, you know, it's very exciting for me. He notably co-edited a book called Computational Thinking Education, a Pedagogy Perspective. And I think it's uh, his ideas about computational thinking, they really resonate for me, particularly for primary and how we might integrate computational thinking in meaningfully with coding and other subjects in the curriculum. So in Aman's seminar tonight, he'll explore the role of computational thinking in formal education. And particularly, this is for primary schools, that's K to five. So that's those children from the age of five years to 11 years old. And he's gonna be highlighting the perspectives of primary teachers and talking about the CT4 Edu project, which I think I, well, I'm really excited to find out more about. And it's all about equity, which of course is so important to all of us teachers and educators generally. So a man, I'm very excited. Um, it's kind of over to you. So please, yeah, share your work. So again, thank you for uh, having me. I have an appointment in the College of Education and College of uh, Natural Science uh, here at MSU. And broadly, my work over the last several years has <clears throat> focused on supporting teachers to bring computational learning experiences to their uh, students, uh, either by integrating them into their core subject areas, so math and science and literacy, or uh, as a standalone uh, CS course. So I'm going to uh, share the CT for EDU project that, that Jane mentioned, uh, where we have worked over the last several years to support elementary teachers uh, to integrate CT. And then I'm going to briefly touch upon a uh, subject uh, or our project where we've been uh, thinking about what does uh, computational thinking actually look like within social studies, art, and English language as well. That's uh, more uh, at the middle school level, so ages 11 to 14. So I'll just give you a preview of uh, of that ongoing work that's uh, started. Just to give you a little bit of background of computing education more broadly in the U.S., in 2008, the National Science Foundation, which is a primary a funding agency to support STEM education in the U.S. started an ambitious effort to have computer science teachers um, or train uh, 10,000 computer science teachers uh, to teach high school computer science. They called the CS10K project. And as a part of that work, they primarily funded the redesign of a, a high school course called CS Principles. That was a new course that, that was developed in collaboration with uh, College Board. And that focuses on like seven big ideas of uh, computer science, so abstraction, algorithms, creativity, um, uh, you know, data, impact, internet, and programming. And they also supported the Exploring Computer Science uh, curriculum uh, that focuses on equity, inquiry, and computer science uh, uh, concepts. In order to do that, there was a lot of work that happened to train new teachers in teaching computer science at the uh, secondary level. So that was primarily done through uh, in-service professional learning experiences, as well as a lot of research that was done uh, on how should we be supporting computer science teachers at the high school level. So over the last 15 years, you know, millions of dollars and um, um, have been uh, put into uh, supporting computer science education at the K-12 level. So what's been the impact of that? So the most recent 
state of CS education report that was released um, uh, earlier this week or last week has found that in the U.S., 57.5% of the U.S. high schools offer foundational computer science, right? So not, you know, not majority, but not by a lot, right? And across 35 states where computer science is offered, only 5.8% of the high school students are actually enrolled in those foundational computer science courses, right? So about 94% of the students in, you know, are not enrolled in computer science courses. So even though they have access to computer science, they may not choose to uh, take computer science courses. And the gender disparity is huge. And only 31% of the students in those high school computer science courses are young women, right? So in spite of uh, like 15 years of um, you know money and lots of professional learning opportunities and efforts from Computer Science Teachers Association, code.org, um, you know, um, uh, uh, ESEP, which is expanding education and um, in, uh, expanding computing education um, pathways. You know, there's been a lot of work. We haven't really made inroads into, you know, that majority of the students are taking computer science courses uh, as as a foundational comp computational literacy. To borrow uh, Andy DeSessa's uh, framing of this work. So then like within this context, our research at Michigan State has focused on how should we be thinking about computing education and how do we ensure that uh, most students are developing that computational literacy? So our work has been uh, driven by three broad questions. What kind of experiences do students need to learn computing concepts and to be confident to pursue computing? And then in order to do that, how do we support teachers and develop teachers' knowledge so they can facilitate high quality learning experiences for their students? And then, and also themselves developing knowledge to integrate computing or teach computing. And that th this work has led us to focus both on CS as a standalone subject. So, um, which is in the upper right quadrant, we have a couple of projects where we have focused on developing in-service teachers' knowledge to teach computer science as a standalone subject. Um, and then at the on a CT end, we have focused on both in-service as well as pre-service. So students in teacher education programs and colleges of education in the US, where we are supporting teachers and pre-service teachers to learn about computing through computational thinking and then how they can use that to support whatever subject area or content they want to teach, right? So I'm going to talk about a couple of those projects, the CT for EDU and the Integrated Computational Thinking Project for the in-service teachers. And then more recently, we just recently got funded from uh, NSF, National Science Foundation, to develop video cases for CT, uh, where we are going to uh, take videos from the work we've already done, as well as uh, record new videos of teachers implementing computational thinking into their classroom and use that as a model to train other teachers. So I'm going to uh, switch gears and talk about the CT for EDU project. So our, our CT for EDU project is uh, a researcher practitioner partnership or started as a researcher practitioner partnership with Oakland schools, uh, which is which has 26 school districts in the Metro Detroit area here in Michigan. So unlike a linear approach to educational research, where researchers come in, I could have gone and say, we want to introduce computing to all students, right? So let's bring computational thinking uh, in your classrooms. We actually worked with teachers uh, in the school districts, uh, the curriculum designers and the and the coaches and the school leadership to conceptualize and design what does computational thinking actually look like in elementary classrooms, especially within the context of math and science uh, learning, right? And as a result, uh, we supported teachers to design uh, lessons to implement computational thinking into their core instruction, primarily math and science, um, and then they implemented those lessons in the classroom. But what is computational thinking? So in, in our work, uh, we defined it as an approach that uh, exposes students to computing ideas and principles in the context of subject areas that they're learning, right? Um, and in particular, we focused on four 
uh, CT practices, right? And we argued that these CT practices are foundational to computer science, and it's important for teachers as well as students to understand what does it mean to think uh, computationally, right? Not just within the context of computer science, but more broadly, like as, as, as young people are uh, getting uh, introduced to these ideas. So the four CT practices uh, involved um, uh, uh, decomposition, right, which is breaking complex problems into more, um, you know, smaller, familiar, manageable subproblems, um, you know, algorithms and, and debugging, like so using steps to uh, solve a problem and then uh, fixing issues if if the solution doesn't match uh, what 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 the students are trying to solve intended, right? Abstraction, which is about reducing complexity. Uh, and then finally, patterns, which is figuring out how the current problem uh, matches pre pre previous problems that students may have solved. So we focused on these uh, practices. And in order to develop the teacher's knowledge around these practices, we engaged them in both unplugged and plugged tasks, right? So unplugged is no computing tools and plugged is computing tools. So on the right side, you see the teacher's uh, here are are making a, a tower with uh, spaghetti uh, that can hold uh, a marshmallow, right? And then we just you know wanted to use that as an icebreaker when we kicked off our summer institute of the PD to allow teachers to connect these CT practices to their daily experiences, right? Um, and we were hoping that would serve as an on ramp for teachers to then later on in our summer professional learning to more computational uh, tools, right? So on the left side, we see teachers are using Dash, the, you know, the program of a robot that, that you're all are familiar with to move through a maze, right? But they're programming it to learn and uh, mathematical ideas, right? Because you have to think about interior and exterior angles as Dash moves uh, through the maze. What I find fascinating in this picture is, you know, both these uh, four teachers that are there, you know, they're, 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 they're paired up. They're actually programming each other, right? The, the, the robot is just sitting there. Uh, and you can see one teacher has an, uh, the tablet on a hand and the other teacher in the blue is sort of executing uh, what the algorithm is going to be or the, what the code is going to do. They could have easily have used the robot itself, right? And so there's a lot of embodied thinking that's going on as they're trying to, you know, solve this problem and 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 debug it. And so you know, and and what we did in one of our PDs was, so how do you feel now that you understand after, uh, you know, spending, um, you know, about three weeks online under learning about CT and now three days in person learning about CT. Uh, where are you at? So we did a meme activity and this is this is where the teachers were, right? So if you've played, uh, 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 played a game of Uno, you know, your choices are plan a CT lesson or draw 25, right? And they're drawing, it's like, oh, maybe drawing 25 is easier than planning a CT lesson, right? And this is Bernie Sanders, you know, meme of like, <laughs> once again, asking you to try something new in your classroom. So, um, and what's been fascinating, you know, that that when we first started this work and it's it's ongoing with Kentwood schools here in Michigan, uh, that we have trained about 45 teachers over the last two years, uh, teachers took up CT in very uh, different ways. So one of my... Um, uh, graduate students Katie Rich, who's now a senior researcher at American senior researcher at American Institutes for Research, um, you know, looked at and and led this study as a part of a CT for EDU work, uh, where she analyzed how teachers are taking up CT from their planning during our professional learning and implementing that in the classroom, right? So here's an example of uh, of a teacher implementing a CT. Uh, lesson. So in the in the planning of the lesson itself, the teacher was very explicit that she was going to use CT um, uh, to engage her kids in um, this task where they're designing uh, rubber band paper rockets, right? So it's an engineering design task. Um, and she calls them hopper poppers, right? And what she does in this lesson, we'll watch this uh, little a minute uh, video here real quick. 
of how she's framing uh, CT at the beginning of the lesson, right? And she's cueing the students to use that uh, CT practice. So I'm gonna play this real quick. Okay. You are going to be working with your same groups. And the reason is because you're gonna have a chance to test your hopper popper, the one you already made, and then you're gonna have a chance to fix your hopper popper, okay? Looking up at my CT wall, after we test our hopper popper and we get a chance to fix it, raise your hand if you see what CT skill we're gonna be using when we're trying to fix our hopper popper. Anna, what CT skill? Debugging. Debugging. How'd you know debugging? Very good. So you're going to be looking while you're testing this first round. You're going to be looking for any mistakes that you might have made or things that you could fix about your hopper popper to make it work better. Okay. You're going to get this scorecard. It's a so what I find fascinating in this in this video, um, and you know, I, I'm happy to send the full paper um, that 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 Katie had led in this study, where CT was explicit in when she was planning that lesson, but it's also explicit in the implementation as well, right? And you know, the the, the CT wall that 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 the teacher refers to is in the you know right corner here, where we have these different CT four CT practices on posters that are hanging in the classroom, right? And she's using the CT practice to facilitate her classroom instruction. And I think there's there's a lot of power to that young girl using debugging, right? Even though it's vocabulary, right? As we think about, you know, expanding, you know, who participates in uh, computing, if young people are, are, are using language right? They see themselves as belonging into, into computing spaces, right? And computing is, or, or, you know, idea of debugging or algorithms is not foreign to them, right? It's like, oh yeah, I can do uh, algorithm design. I can belong in computing because I understand what that is, right? I think so that's, if I had $10 million, I'd love to follow these kids, you know, through, uh, uh, through their lives and see how, where they're at now, you know, um, they're probably in middle school by now. Right. And so I think that's 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 been the benefit or at least intended uh, uh, benefit that we expect from the work we're doing. And then I'm going to show another video here here in a minute where similarly another teacher uh, integrated CT into her math lesson in the lesson plan itself. Again, this is from the same study. Uh, where the teacher wrote that students will engage in abstraction when they look at visual representation of mixed numbers, identifying the whole and the ex uh, extra, right? So she's explicitly using the CT practice in the planning itself, right? Um, and then this is this is what's on the board. Um, uh, that's you know the numbers, the, the fractions uh, that you can't we can't quite see. So I'm going to play this video real quick. From thirds. Okay. What else? Did we say? Because I heard some other answers as well, Liam. One, two, uh, one whole in two thirds. One whole in two thirds. Which is basically what I want to say. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah. Down into just like okay. So Liam, you, you're showing us that mixed number here, and you're saying these two are really the same. And I, Travis, remember we're showing with talk loops, but I know that was what you were saying on the last example. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we know that they can match up and I see some of us agreeing and some disagreeing. So Liam, can you explain, cause I don't see a one anywhere up there. And I think some other friends are like, where is he getting one from? Or where's two thirds from? Do you, do you want to go up there and show or you want to just explain it? So again, like what we noticed in this, uh, in this uh, classroom video was that even though in the lesson plans, the CT was explicit, she never brings up those CT practices uh, in the classroom or uses the vocabulary, right? It's just implicit in how she's engaging. Again, the goal is to learn mathematical ideas, right? But the teacher uses abstraction, but not explicit uh, that vocabulary in the implementation itself. And what's been fascinating is that, oh, um, here's another uh, example of a teacher who designed a plug task, right? So in this case, 
again, the dash and dot have to um, uh, move in a uh, in a square, right? And so that's the task, and the kids are learning about perimeter. They're learning about um, uh, they're learning about angles, right? And then you can see that you know this is the worksheet that the that that the teacher had, and as he engages students in this uh, in this video, like I'll let you read this for a minute, right? Um, where the teacher says, so with the people sitting next to you, I want you to turn and talk about what are some things that you need to think about with these directions? For example, the total distance, the shape of the path that the robot uh, must follow, right? So again, in this case, we see that even in a context for plugged task, the teacher is using CT, helping them like focus on what are the critical features of a problem that you need to focus on as you're working on. Uh, on this problem. And then later on, uh, the teacher says, some of the groups are finding out that they made a plan that involves a robot traveling in certain direction. Oh, there are some really some things that you need to think about that are a little bit different. So if your planning involves just moving and sliding around, you might have to think and uh, you might have to add in different things and try that out, right? So it's talking about algorithmic thinking and debugging, right? So even in the context of a plug task, the teacher is uh, using the CT vocabulary to help them facilitate, um, you know, uh, uh, solving that task. And, and 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 more recently, the way that we have been thinking about, and then we wrote a, a conceptual piece about this is, is that, the teachers really have taken up CT explicitly to engage their kids in metacognitive processes, right? So think about their own thinking as they're solving these problems, right? So algorithmic thinking is about planning how to proceed, identifying steps needed to solve the problem, and then executing those steps, right? Similarly, debugging is about monitor your solution, assess your solution, and trying out new strategies when one doesn't work. Um, and then similarly, abstraction, right, is focusing on the most essential details of the problem, right? And so define the problem, think about what's most relevant as you're uh, solving this problem and how do you address those critical features of the problem that you're focusing on. And then finally, decomposition is about simplifying a complex problem by breaking it down into subproblems, right? And so, you know, that's been a shift in my thinking uh, and and our research team, because we very much went in with our computing is our primary goal, right? But that's not how teachers took this up, right? They're like, it's giving me a way to support my students in whatever they're learning, right? Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about another study uh, uh, here in a minute uh, that's explicitly just focused on science, Right, so <clears throat> this is another study where that, that that's an ongoing work that we're doing with Smithsonian uh, Institute uh, and their science team, where they have developed a curriculum for uh, third and fifth grade to uh, integrate computational thinking, and they're explicitly using Scratch as a way for teachers to integrate computing or computational thinking into their science lesson. Right. And so we're in the process of analyzing the data and we, we gave teachers, so there were over a hundred teachers that participated in this uh, PD and we collected data from them and we have uh, data from uh, 44 teachers that you know completed all the surveys and participated in, in, in interviews that we did. And so we one, one of the uh, survey categories focused on like what value do teachers see uh, NCT both before they come to the PD and after they come to the PD. So this first set of bars uh, focuses on, um, you know, the value in computing across the curriculum, right? So 62% of the teachers already strongly agreed that CT is going to be valuable across the curriculum for me, right? Right. So they're coming in with that, but like after the PD, 91% of them believe that CT uh, could be applied broadly across the curriculum, right? 71% um, in the second set of uh, bars here, uh, believe that CT would allow them to teach their subject area better, that jumped to 87% uh, in the post survey, right? And similarly, like al allowing my students to engage in higher order thinking skills, jump from 71% to 93% from pre to post survey, right? 
And so like that, so there's even teachers who are participating in PD that, you know, brings like coding platform like Scratch into uh, their work. Teachers are already making these connections that it's valuable across the curriculum, right? It engages them in higher order thinking skills. And like, here's a quote from uh, from one of the teachers from the interview, uh, right? And, and, and she says, ways to make cross-curricular link, links to bring science into math and math into science and reading and make it all encircling. So it's not just one subject here, one subject there. They get to see how it impacts all the different subject areas and how it can be used in all different content areas. And CT just gives it a more holistic approach or the whole world approach, right? So, and, and then we keep hearing even on a CT for EDU project that CT ties things together for teachers in ways that they haven't felt like other efforts have done it, right? Um, and then um, we also ask teachers, like, do they feel like CT, um, uh, how could they plan for CT? And what's been fascinating, like even in the pre-survey, you know, 33% strongly agreed that CT will constrain their teaching, right? And 29% somewhat dis uh, disagreed with that, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, but then that jumped up to 47%, right? And what's been fascinating, what's interesting is that 31% of the teachers, even after the PD, agreed that CT will constrain their teaching, right? Even though they're making these cross-curricular, you know, can see connections, right? There was a jump in that from about 9% or like if even if you combine, you know, 16% to 31% or even more, you know, sorry, yeah, uh, 44%, right? If you combine somewhat agree and strongly agree. But then they also see that it allows them to bring coding into their classroom, the jump from pre to post, right? They agreed with that, right? And then right, that they can integrate different aspects of CT concepts, the decomposition, abstraction, algorithm design, and debugging into their classroom. So we wanted to dig a little bit more in like, what is it about um, uh, integrating CT that teachers feel that it'll, it constrains them, right? So in the interviews, it became more clear why that is the case, right? And one teacher said, I see kids really once or twice a week and it's really hard for me to get into all of these things. So I feel like I rush, right? Another teacher said, some things I really think that are harder for us come up with computer-based coding and things like that, right? Two things, CT and coding that I keep on trying to put together, which I know it's not only that, but that's what I keep on going back to. I don't know how to do that. So even though teachers see CT as a valuable approach, when they attend a PD that has coding in it, they feel like they don't have enough of a knowledge to be able to do that, right? And which is, I'm not surprised by that. Like, you know, teachers, elementary teacher, primary teachers, at least in the US, do a lot. And now we're asking them to also like integrate coding into your math or science, right? Um, teachers don't, have that knowledge and background in computing. And they're also not curriculum designers, right? And we shouldn't expect teachers to be curriculum designers like to figure out how to integrate computing into their classroom. We need to develop resources that teachers that allow teachers to integrate computing and coding in ways um, that, that that's natural, right? Or the one of the models that we've been doing here um, uh, in our work is, you know, most schools have a STEAM teacher, like, or a, a special, like, uh, uh, technology class, right? So we are asking our schools to not only have their primary school teachers, but also their technology teacher, or the technology coach, or the STEAM teacher be a part of our PD as well, because then those teachers and coaches can facilitate more coding or computational rich uh, experiences uh, in those teachers' classrooms, and I, so that's one approach um, that 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 has seemed to be working now in our work with uh, Kentwood schools. And then finally, like, what are the teachers' efficacy for CT? Right, teachers generally in this work after the PD 
strongly agreed or agreed that um, you know they can help their students uh, understand foundational computer science ideas, right? Which is those debugging abstraction, right? Which they can they can do, right? Uh, they know how they can help their students find information related to CT or CS tasks, right? And then you know um, they can encourage their students to make an initial plan, work through setbacks, the debugging part, right? Uh, and revise their plans, right? So when it comes to having CT these practices as as a skill that can the teachers teach, they feel confident that they can teach those. They can they can help explain what debugging is, what algorithm design is, what decomposition is, right? Where they often struggle is uh, when they want to bring those coding experiences into the class, especially within the context of math or science or literacy, right? So the way that we have, as a result of all this work that we've been doing over the last you know, eight to 10 years is that CT is really about thinking and sometimes about computing to support disciplinary learning uh, in primary classrooms, right? And so our North Star, that's become, that, that's become our North Star, right? Let's not say that you have to integrate coding into your classroom. Let's use these CT practices as an on-ramp to bring those computationally rich experiences into classrooms down the road, but we can't start there, right? And we've seen that in, in our work with teachers too. In the first year, teachers are not as comfortable bringing Scratch or you know uh, Dash and Dot or Spheros into their classroom. But as we continue to engage them and work with them, they make that jump, right? Not in year one, year two or year three, right? But they don't start there, or many don't start there in year one. The only uh, one one teacher who, or a couple of teachers we have, we have had who have done that uh, were more confident in uh, you know just using technology in general or had taught technology as a specials or STEAM teachers. Right? So that's that's been our elementary work. Um, we've been more recently shifting into middle school as well, which is ages eleven through fourteen. So I'm going to quickly uh, share that as well. So this is our integrated computational thinking work with uh, my colleague, uh, Rafi Carlos was involved in it and Sachil who was a postdoc here and now a faculty at uh, Florida State and David Phelps, who's a research fellow with TLOS Learning. So we wanted to understand what does CT look like within the context of uh, social studies, uh, English language arts and art classrooms uh, at the middle school level. And so we conducted three Delphi studies. So Delphi studies is we brought disciplinary experts in each of those three disciplines as three separate groups and uh, introduced them to what computational thinking was and then had uh, several focus groups on what do they think computational thinking might look like in social studies and arts and ELA. And so we developed uh, uh, what are we calling learning pathways on each of those disciplines then CT, then that teachers can use to bring CT into their classrooms. And so I'm gonna quickly share our learning pathways in, in social studies first, and then arts and then, and then ELA. So within social studies, one of our big buckets of a learning pathway is supporting students to create models and representations in social studies, right? So using maps, simulations, flow charts, timelines, where teachers can bring those in to help students see the complex dynamics of social and political topics. Um, our second uh, bucket of learning pathways, integration pathways is supporting students engage in data practices for social studies uh, inquiry. And I'm gonna give, a, a, give an example of that real quick uh, on the next slide. And then third is how does computing impact society, right? All from social, economic, and political aspects. And given what's happening across the world, I think it's important for students to understand how, and especially with AI, right? Uh, I was giving Jane an example of how AI, or for that matter, any technology can be used for bad purposes as well, right? So how do we develop that foundational literacy for kids that how computing impact their lives or has potential to impact both positive as well as uh, negative? And then how can they use uh, computing 
to take action, like for social action, right? So an example of um, one of our pathways for en engaging data in data practices for social studies inquiry is, uh, here's an example from on the right side from building caring communities that creating maps of assets in a community, right? So students gather information and then uh, map where are some resources and assets within a particular community, right? To see connections between individuals and organizations, um, right? And uh, hopefully increase the capacity of a community to meet the needs of its residents, right? So that's one of the one of the practices. Then, and the way we have thought about it is that that data is increase increasingly critical to understand our world, right? And being data literate is a key element to being an informed and engaged citizen, uh, right? So that's that's one of our practices, um, or learning pathways in social studies. Similarly, within art, you know, one of our pathways is um, supporting students to create computational art, right? That we can actually use computing to create a new kinds of art, right? And uh, uh, one of our teachers um, in, in, in our uh, fellowship as a part of this work, um, you know, uh, talked about how you can actually use um, uh, use a data that you collect over a period of time uh, to create weather quilts, right? Uh, right. Again, it's it's a very art art artsy uh, task, but it's driven by computing and using uh, data, right? But students can also explore data through or art through computational uh, thinking practices. Um, like how, how do artists use computational tools or how do these CT practices can help students understand and how an artist went through the process of creating an artwork. Um, also seeing data in art and making data as art, right? So the next slide sort of highlights that, right? Uh, that we might think of art and data as coming from separate worlds, but there are so many powerful examples of how art can be use to communicate, right? So they can use data to create new kinds of art, but they can also understand art through uh, data. Like I love this, um, the middle one by uh, by Jill Pelto, right? The decrease in greater mass balance, right? And it's basically, you know, um, a chart, right? But it's, 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 uh, it's an uh, artist, uh, artistic uh, piece. And then finally, uh, our uh, learning pathway in language arts focus on students using computational methods to analyze text, right? Um, students can enhance their writing through computational practices like graphic organizers, right? Uh, flow charts and things like that. And then finally, you know, students can themselves uh, create uh, an interactive computational texts right, using computation, right? So we can also integrate CT uh, into language art. And again, here's an example. Oh, and then finally, um, critically analyzing computational texts and practices too, right? Students use social media platforms and uh, media tools, right, every day, right? So how can we have students critically look at what they encounter uh, online, right? And how computing tools shape meaning and like, um, change our broader communication uh, culture. Again, an example of this is, you know, supporting students uh, to analyze text through computational uh, methods, right? So in the middle, right, students can analyze uh, textual data and identify uh, patterns, right? So here's an example of how uh, many women-centered headlines uh, explicitly use gendered uh, terms like mother, waitress, right? Uh, right, and that highlight underlying stereotypes uh, across, you know, all countries, India, South Africa, UK, and the US, right? Um, right, also this is, yep. Um, so like, so what we've done, just an example, we have the pathway and then we have specific practices within each of the pathways, right? So the uh, uh, engaging students in data practices has sub uh, practices that teachers can focus on that we have. And you can all see this uh, on our uh, Building Blocks website of for CT integration. So projects.ctintegration.org uh, has general 
CT practices teacher can, teachers can explore? And then what are these learning pathways and associated practices look like uh, in each of the disciplines of language, art, social studies, uh, and arts? And if you click on those, you'll see you know, some of the examples that are highlighted. Yeah, so you can you can actually look through all our um, uh, all the materials uh, for learning pathways, the associated practices, as well as what we're calling an inspiration library that David uh, Phelps, who's uh, who's our collaborator on the project, uh, has developed. Thank you all for listening, and I'm looking forward to the conversation next. Can we all give a, a man a, like a little silent clap? I'm just so excited. It's so brilliant. Um, I, I think there's just so much food for thought within your presentation. And some of the things that I took away from it was this idea that it's CT is not just for coding. And I think we have got a little bit obsessed in the UK with the coding side, but kind of drawing back to the thinking, I think is, I think is, is just really fundamental. And how you made the association between the use of vocabulary and belonging and that kind of equity piece there um and also that kind of normalization across the different subjects and how you talked about it, like as ct becoming glue between subjects and then seeing how you've i just really love the middle school stuff and how you're integrating again just the ct practices but particularly around data and data literacy i want to say to a man thank you for your contribution to our field because as i said before i've been quoting your work for just so long and it's just brilliant to have you here so i want to say thank you Coming up, we've got our seminar on the 12th of December with, with Anna Clara from Glasgow University, who's going to be doing grounded cognition. And that was one of the things that a man was talking about was this thing of embodied con cognition. So that's really exciting. And I just want to kind of put you on notice that for 2024, we're going to be uh, looking at programming with and without AI. So very excited. We've got Barbara Erickson. Uh, we've got uh, Brett. Becca is going to be presenting and lots of other amazing people in that field. So thank you very much for coming along.